I did see All right, everybody. Well, thanks Thanks for joining us. Uh, Let's begin. My name is Adam White. I'm a senior fellow here at AEI. I'm so glad you could join us today for a conversation about this book, Who Decides? States as Laboratories of Constitutional Experimentation. And I should add at the outset that this event is the latest uh, installment of the Edward and Helen Hintz book forum at AEI. Uh, These forums provide a platform to host prominent authors for discussion of new and forthcoming books on issues of national significance. And we're grateful to Edward and Helen Hintz for their support of AEI and their deep commitment to our mission. And when it comes to books on issues of national significance, I guess it couldn't get more significant than the Constitution itself. We're so lucky uh, and grateful to get to host its author, Chief Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Judge Sutton served on the Sixth Circuit since 2003. Before that, he was Ohio's state solicitor. He clerked for uh, Justices Lewis Powell and Antonin Scalia. And as it happens, he co-edited the recent book, The Essential Scalia, with Ed Whalen. Uh, now, around here at AEI, we think of uh, Chris Scalia, our colleague, as the essential Scalia. Uh, he, <laughs> that's what he tells us. Uh, but we're also lucky to be joined uh, by Eugene Scalia. Eugene is a partner at Gibson and Dunn. He was the U.S. Secretary of Labor from 2019 to 2021. Uh, and he is one of the leading constitutional and regulatory lawyers of our time. And he's keeping very busy these days, I suspect. Uh, but let's just jump right in with the broadest question. I mean, it's impossible to do justice to a book of such breadth and such depth in just one session. But maybe, Judge, if you could give us an overview of of what's the book and how does it follow on your your earlier project, 51 Imperfect Solutions? Yeah, well, well, thank you, Adam and Gene, for being here. Thank you to AEI for hosting this. It's a real honor to be here and to be Justice Scalia's old stomping grounds and now Christopher Scalia's current stomping grounds. So it's a very strange book for a federal judge to write. Uh, This is my 19th year as a federal judge, and I've had just two cases involving state constitutions. So I never get this in my day job. And um, and for what it's worth, those two cases, it was quite an inconsequential issue. So why would I spend my time outside of judging uh, writing about state constitutions? And um, part of it was my experience as the Ohio Solicitor General uh, back in the mid-90s, where I, I learned that state constitutions could be really salient. Um, I tell my students that I could teach a semester-long class on state constitutional law based solely on cases I lost in the Ohio Supreme Court (laughs) under the Ohio Constitution. I mean, you think I'm kidding, I'm not. School funding, my first $35 billion loss, school vouchers, tort reform, criminal procedure. And out of that experience just grew this fascination of why do we have this single story about constitutional law in America where we obsess about teaching just half of the story, the federal side, and just the story of one court, the U.S. Supreme Court. And, you know, that experience working in state government made me realize there was a lot to learn from state courts and state constitutions. So the first book is really focused on individual rights, Um, uh, you know, individuals it's almost pandering. People are more likely to pay attention to individual rights because they protect them, after all. Um, but the second book, Who Decides, is, is probably the one I, I like more and care a little more about because, in Justice Scalia's words, um, structure is everything. And the second book is what we can learn from the state constitutions and state courts when it comes to how they organize government. And I guess there's just a couple themes just to start and kind of showing why I think state constitutions are really salient today and maybe going to be even more so in the future. One thing going on is we have occasional situations where the U.S. Supreme Court puts up a big red stop sign. Um, Think uh, Rucho and redistricting. Um, Think Kelo and takings. Think of Blaisdell, impairment of contracts. God only knows what's going to happen with abortion. But... The key thing is the U.S. Supreme Court sometimes says uh, we're not open for business when it comes to that particular issue, that particular right. And one thing citizens have a remarkable ignorance about is the reality that there's a second opportunity to protect yourself or your client uh, from a state or local law, state or local criminal prosecution, and that's to use the state constitutions. Um, You know, the Bill of Rights, the 14th Amendment, the structure of our federal constitution all of that originated in the state constitutions. The greatest era of state of constitution writing is 1776 to 1786, before the fabled summer in Philadelphia. 
which gets to a second reason why state constitutions are really important today, and I think people are starting to pay a little more attention to them. Um, if you've been following the confirmation hearing for now Judge Jackson, soon likely to be Justice Jackson, um, you know, she seems to pay attention to original public meaning. I don't know if that's her exclusive theory for interpreting constitutions, but clearly original public meaning is quite relevant to figuring out the meaning of the federal constitution. If you're an originalist, you have to be a state constitutionalist. It's impossible to fairly practice originalism, fairly interpret the federal constitution without looking at the source code for that language. And the source code for just about everything except federalism are the state constitutions, whether the early ones or later ones, state court decisions, later ones. Think of Justice Scalia's decision in Heller as a way of thinking about it. Um, the, the third thing I would point out, which is very structurally driven, and this was the, the surprise about writing this book, and I, I just think it's not appreciated that much, is I had not realized how locked into the 18th century our federal constitution still is. It's very Republican, in many ways quite non-democratic. And the reason it's locked in that 18th century political science philosophical mindset is the federal constitution is so difficult to amend. It takes three quarters of the states to ratify. So we've had amendments, of course, but most of them are rights-driven, not a lot of structural amendments since 1789. What's happened at the state level? It is just, it's like the, it's a growth stock. It is just one direction throughout American history. And what is that direction? It is the people in the states deciding they want to vote for more government officials. They want to divide up government in more ways. And eventually it ends with the initiative. Remove the middleman. Let's have referenda where we vote directly to overrule a statute or constitutional initiatives where we vote what's going to be in our constitution directly. And so the gap between the national structure of government and the state's hyper-democratic forms of government just grows and grows and grows. And I, I think that has a lot of implications for how we deal with problems today. But, you know, and just one last point on this before we get into more specifics this non-democratic feature of the national government, when you hear people complain about that, I mean, in recent years, a lot of people, I guess I would say more on the progressive democratic side, would complain that, oh, it's so non-democratic. See the electoral college. See two senators for every state, including a state with not a very big population. And that, that is, of course, both of these are very non-democratic features of the nas national government. But those aren't the only non-democratic features of the national government. I would say the most non-democratic feature of the national government, in fact, it sometimes looks like gerrymandering itself, is, of course, judicial review. You don't get any more non-democratic than having five life tenure justices identify new unenumerated rights, new substantive due process rights, and then have them basically irreversible because it's so difficult to amend the federal constitution. So, and that particular issue can resonate in both directions. So, you know, I, I would say that really infected, you know, my views, um, or affected, I hope not infected, maybe a little <laughs> of both. Uh, sometimes I get really irritated, so infection might be the right word. Um, but yes, that's, those would be the, the general takeaways. Well, that's great. Maybe we'll focus on courts in just a second, but something you said a moment ago that raises a question. When you say understanding the Constitution means understanding state constitutions, are you focused on understanding our, the U.S. Constitution's original meaning with reference to state constitutions? Are you, do you mean understanding modern constitutional debates with respect to modern constitutions, or, or is it both? Well, the beauty of state constitutions is it has something for everyone. Um, so for the person that believes in original public meaning, I said earlier that you really have to be a state constitutionalist, and I, I said it with a lot of conviction, and I, I really believe it. I don't know how you can decide what free speech search and seizure guarantees mean, how separation of powers operates, Article I, Article II, Article III, without looking at what the states did and why they did it. You know, it's not just that the states had all ratified state constitutions before 1787 and even 1789. Some of the states had actually done experimentation. I mean, Phil, Phil, um, Pennsylvania had its own constitution, realized some of the flaws with that, fixed those flaws. So by the time 
you get to 1787, there's actually already been some trial and error. But my, fir my first point is from the originalist perspective, constitutional interpretation, you really do need to look, look to state, the original state constitutions and how the state courts interpreted them. In fact, judicial review itself goes out of the state experience. I mean, had John Marshall never been born, the election of 1800 never happened, had there never been a Marbury or a Madison, we would have had judicial review all the same. Why is that? The state courts were doing it before 1789 under their state constitutions with their state court judges. I mean, in fact, we can circle back at some point what lessons there are to learn from that. But I said state constitutions can help with federal constitutional interpretation from an original public meaning perspective. They can also help from, say, a pragmatic, a Justice Breyer perspective, or a living constitutionalist, um, a Justice Kagan perspective, let's say, or Justice Ginsburg. And that's because, you know, the living, it's a caricature of the living constitutionalists to say they look in the mirror and see what is coming back at them as the federal constitution as they desire it. That's, that's really unfair. What's a more fair way to put living constitutionalism is they're saying there's some very general guarantees in the federal constitution, and why can't we account for shifting norms in society in interpreting those general guarantees? Well, for that theory of interpretation to have any, the remotest form of legitimacy, they've got to look outside themselves for evidence of those shifting norms. What better place to look for evidence of shifting norms than the state constitutional experience? That can be hyper-democratic state constitutions, which constantly get amended because 51% is usually all that's required. It can be state constitutional decisions. It can be state legislation. So one wonderful feature of state constitutions is it not only gives you a second shot when the US Supreme Court puts up a stop sign, but it offers lessons and really tools for all methods for interpreting the federal constitution. So it's, I think it should all be about a dialogue and it should be American constitutional law, not federal or state constitutional law. They, they should work together. Since you mentioned the power of judicial review, maybe that's a good place to start. We'll have a couple more examples. We'll bring Gene into the conversation. But how should we understand judicial review, its origins in the states? Well, this, this one is definitely from the focus of um, the originalist, and, and that's my bias for what it's worth. Um, I, having worked for Justice Scalia, I've just not been able to get this little thing off my shoulder <laughs> ever since, uh, whispering in my ear, original public meaning, original public meaning, and um, I, I'm actually very convinced he was right. Um, if you believe in original public meaning, the early state experiences of judicial review are so valuable because all we know from the federal constitution of 1789 is it has article three. It refers to a judicial power. It refers to cases or controversies. It doesn't say a lot more. Even if you decide to read Hamilton's you know, 78, it does, you know, there's not a lot more that you're gonna learn about how judicial review works. And of course the federal constitution famously doesn't even expressly permit judicial review. What's really fascinating about the state court cases is they do two things that seem to be opposites. On the one hand, they say judicial review, striking invalid statutes, is something they're duty bound to do. And they say it's a matter of judicial duty because they say law, there are higher, there's a hierarchy of laws, constitutions are superior laws to state statutes, state constitution, superior to a state statute. If there's a conflict between the state constitution and the state statute, the judge is duty bound to honor the state, the state constitution over the inferior state statute. So that suggests judicial review you know, should be done almost in a muscular way. It's, it's part of the oath and it's a, a duty bound obligation for the judge. But there's another part of their experience which cuts in the other way. And that's that they worked very hard to avoid true conflicts. Uh, so sometimes they would conf construe the statute to avoid the conflict, narrow the statute. So a lot, a lot of folks today are very skeptical of constitutional avoidance as a tool of statutory interpretation, sometimes very critical of the Chief Justice in, in some of his opinions. And we don't need to debate those opinions, but I will say this, if you take original public meaning seriously, you have to acknowledge that constitutional avoidance 
was a tool in the state court judge's toolbox. And it would be very strange to me to assume the judicial power, the duty to invalidate statutes that conflict with the Constitution doesn't come with that tool of interpretation. It doesn't prove you're always doing it right. It doesn't prove sometimes you're being too aggressive. That's a debate you know, for another day. But you know, for me, and I guess you know, sometimes um, you're happy to see things in history. And I found myself quite happy to see that because I happen to be a federal judge that worries the footprint of the federal courts is a little bigger than it should be. And so uh, it warmed my heart to see that's what the state court judges did initially. And I can't wait to beat my colleagues over the head with that when the opportunity comes. Um, so yeah, so I think you can learn something about federal judicial review from the early state court experiences. Right, and maybe another example that you know well, the, the structure of the state executive branch. You served under the state attorney general in Ohio. And, and the states have experimented, as you mentioned, much more in the structure of their executive branch. So why don't you describe that? Yeah, Jacksonian populism is amazing. You give everybody the, the right to vote, good development for sure. They love it, and let's, they want to find as many things to vote for as possible. And uh, so you have this unitary executive. By the way, the unitary executive is, the feds do that because all the states were doing that initially. You didn't get the plural executive till quite a bit later. And now it's remarkable. I can't remember which state it is, but one state has 43 statewide officials that they separately elect, you know, including superintendent of the Department of Insurance. I mean, God knows how the citizens of that state are making that decision. I mean, I, <laughs> I assume it has a lot to do with name recognition. Um, but the, the plural executive at the state level is just fascinating at so many levels. Uh, you have conflicts between governors and attorneys general, for example, about what the legal position of the state should be. We've had a lot of that lately in cases at the US Supreme Court with amicus filings and party filings. Is the governor in charge of the litigation? Is the AG in charge of litigation? And often they can be from different political parties. Um, so, and even frankly, when they're from the same political party, a competing ambition can be even worse than being for an oppos opposite political party. But it leads to all kinds of odd and amusing stories. Um, there's one in California, you, you all remember, uh, you know, Jerry Brown was running for president in 1980, I think I've got it right. He was governor at the time of California. He left the state, um, presumably to raise some money in DC, comes here, and California had this dated provision that says the lieutenant governor, effectively the vice president, separately elected. So lieutenant governor of California at the time was a, um, a Republican while Jerry Brown was a Democrat. And the state constitution said when the governor, quote, leaves the state, uh, the lieutenant governor is in charge, Brown gets on his plane, goes to D.C. to raise some money. As soon as he leaves, the lieutenant governor fills a vacancy on the California Supreme Court. I mean, you just got to love this stuff. <laughs> and um, now Brown was not amused. He comes back, files a lawsuit saying you have no such authority. He loses because the lieutenant governor had honored the statute. But it turned out the, he did have an ace up his sleeve. The governor did, that is. And that was that you were allowed to undo appointments within, I forget what it was, 30, 60 days. So Brown ultimately undid the appointment. I think the guy ultimately ended, he did end up, I mean, he was a pawn in this whole game, but he did end up on the California Supreme Court, but it might have taken six years or so. But that's such a remarkable contrast. I mean, we think of all our independent council debates and all of those things at the federal level, they all grow out of this pro problem with the unitary executive. What do you do when there's just one person in charge of everything? The states don't have that problem. They have independently elected AGs that can be their independent councils if time uh, allows or the circumstances require it. What, what, what are the lessons to draw from that, that example then? Maybe other than Justice Scalia was right and Morrison v. Olson about the importance of uh, a unitary executive. Well, you know, I'm a huge fan of using the state court experiences and importing them into federal law, including the meaning of the federal constitution at many levels, but I would be horrified with a plural executive at the federal level. I, I cannot imagine how it would function. Um, you know, separately electing Gene Scalia for Secretary of Labor. I mean, <laughs> I guess I like it. I, I'd like you to have that independence, but I just don't know how you could run the government. And, and I guess what I really worry about 
is national defense. I mean, that's just, you know, the states don't have that obligation. And, you, you know, in Hamilton's words, you need an energetic executive for some national things. And clearly, national defense would be one, you know, arguably a, a depression might be another. But um, so I, sometimes it, it's wonderful that the hyper-democratic states, the plural executive states are where they are, and the non-democratic unitary executive federal government is the way it is, it is, I think. But that's happenstance. That was not a function of any framework. No one saw this coming, that democracy would take off the way it has at the state level. Um, but I don't think it, I don't think the system hurts us. Um, I don't think I'm in favor of voting for 43 statewide officials. I might, four or five seem about right. But I, you know, in Ohio, watching it and working in state government in Ohio, I didn't think it had too many problems. It does force people to work together from time to time. Um, by the way, it's those separately elected officials that are often in the middle of redistricting. So that's another interesting dy dynamic, and particularly interesting if they come from different parties. In a unitary executive, you wouldn't have that problem. So. Interesting. Well, I'm sure we'll circle back to federal state differences in a bit. Uh, one more example that we'll look at, but before I get to that, we'll have a chance for audience questions in the conversation, including questions for folks who are watching online. And so if you're not here and you'd like to submit a question, you can do it two ways. One is uh, on Twitter, where all good conversations, of course, happen, um, uh, using hashtag AEI who decides, and I'll receive those questions. Or you can send them by email to our colleague Sophie Rizzieri, and her email address is on the, the web page for this event. So send your questions in. Uh, one last sort of introductory example is administrative law. It's a very interesting time at the federal level, in the federal courts and in Congress and elsewhere, thinking through reforms to administrative law. Uh, but often here in Washington, we forget that these conversations are having around the country where states have long experimented with ex administrative law. And, and right now, you're seeing a lot of experiment as well. And so that's a, a major part of the book. Yeah, I, I said the hyper-democracy of the states relative to the non-democratic national government was the key surprise from writing this book. But the second one was when I started down the road, I knew I wanted to write a chapter on administrative law, but I had no idea how varied the state experience would be. And that, to me, is just stunning at so many levels. So at the federal level, the two big doctrines that you know everybody at DC is talking about and the court is debating intensely are these two forms of delegation, an express delegation by Congress to an agency to exercise all kinds of policy-making power, sometimes without many guardrails. That's what leads to the debate about whether there ought to be a non-delegation doctrine that's enforced more than two times in the year 1935. The second form of delegation is not express, it's implied. It's where Congress is silent. They leave an ambiguity, a gap in the statute, and there, they're either impliedly delegating policy-making power to the agency, or more controversially, impliedly delegating interpretive power to the agency to interpret the gap in the statute. And those are the two big debates at the federal level. You know, and so one is Chevron, and the other, Schecter Poultry, and you know, is that going to get new life? You know, see Gandhi, where the court looked to be on the precipice of maybe enforcing the non-delegation doctrine again. Now, there's a lot behind those debates, and, and you know, Gene Scalia is, given, you know, is the true expert up here on that. Well, Adam's not bad himself on this as well. I'm the one who's clearly not the expert. But here's the thing that really surprised me about the state experience, and I think you'll find equally interesting. The states in general, which often lockstep with the federal court decisions about individual rights and other interpretations of the federal constitution, they have kind of a presumption in favor of following what the feds do, do not remotely do that with administrative law. So there's only stu two states in the country that incorporate Chevron by name. I'd say of the 50 state courts, roughly 10 have a kind of a deference regime that looks, looks like Chevron, even though it's not exactly Chevron. So that means there are 40 that don't follow Chevron, some quite explicitly. Uh, the Florida Constitution was amended a few years ago to um, uh, for prohibit Chevron. So the Florida Constitution, 62% of Floridians voted to prohibit Chevron in their state. I mean, the idea that 42, 62% of 
our Floridians even know what administrative deference is is astonishing to me. I mean, what an educated voter base. Um, <laughs> states like Arizona and Wisconsin have prohibited um, administrative deference by statute. The Mississippi Supreme Court has a recent decision where it prohibited Chevron deference as a matter of state separation of powers. Um, there are 43 states, according to Keith Whittington, I think Jason Ayano's article, 43 states that in one way or another enforce the non-delegation doctrine as well. So here we have 40 states not following administrative deference, 43 states kind of enforcing the non-delegation doctrine. So remember, they're, they're interpreting a similar constitution, right? Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. In fact, some of the state constitutions have even more explicit language where they, they say not only impliedly that the three branches of government are separate, but then they'll have this kind of belt and suspenders clause that'll say the executive branch cannot exercise the legislative or the judicial power and then kind of go, th go around the circle. You might think those clauses don't have any meaning or effect on federal interpretations for non-delegation or Chevron, but no less than Justice Scalia, in his Morrison and Ol versus Olson dissent, invoked the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, which has this exact clause. And I think he was right to do that. Um, they're, they're really kind of making it clear that there's, it's a separation of personnel. You can't have the same person occupying all three branches. Well, um, what do we have? You know, if it was bad to have a legislator serving as a judge, separation of personnel problem, what do we have with a federal agency? We have one person exercising all three powers. That has to be the worst of all worlds. So the state experiences here really kind of add some oomph to the folks that think Chevron is hard to justify from a matter of separation of powers at the federal level that maybe the non-delegation doctrine ought to be enforced more often. And then last of all, the state experience answers a, um, a question that many federal judges, some federal justices, including Justice Scalia, had raised about getting rid of Chevron, about enforcing the non-delegation doctrine more vigorously. And that question was this. It was almost like, is, is, is it just too late in the day to do this? The agencies exercise so much authority. Wouldn't government just come to a halt if we suddenly prohibited these kinds of implied or explicit delegations? Well, if that was truly a legitimate fear, we would have evidence of it in the states that don't have Chevron or the states that prohibit unduly broad delegations from the legislature to their agencies. There is no evidence that any state suddenly said, oh, we've got to go back to administrative deference. We've got to go back to not enforcing the non-delegation doctrine because government has ground to a halt or the judges can't figure out how to interpret this constitutional guarantee. So that's, that seems like a very useful piece of information for those that have worried about what it means to cut back on Chevron or what it means to enforce non-delegation a little more often. Now, you know, I'm an intermediate court of appeals judge. I'm not saying what should happen. I report to them, and they reverse me from time to time, as they probably should. Um, but the key thing is that justification, if that's going to be a justification, it needs to respond to these state experiences. And, you know, proving that the salience of state courts and state constitution is on the rise, I should point out that these articles that I relied very heavily on, they're all in the last 10 years. Um, no one was writing about this stuff in the 70s, 80s, even the 90s. So it's really the last decade or so that people are starting to think about the state experiences and whether they have meaning for the federal experience and just you know what we can get out of it. Um, so to me, that makes this all the more exciting. Okay, well, those are just three of many topics in the book, and we'll circle back to some others. But I do want to bring Gene into the conversation, not just on administrative law, but on anything we've discussed. And in the run-up to this event, while we were chatting, you had mentioned that your own interest in state constitutions and state constitutional law goes, goes far back, too. Yeah, Adam, thanks. Thanks for uh, inviting me here to AEI, uh, which my father did have a strong affiliation with and was uh, very proud of for years. And, and it's really a treat to join uh, uh, Chief Judge Sutton. Uh, Jeff. Former, uh, I'll, I'll get there fast, Jeff. Don't worry about it. Uh, that was but, fast. Uh, but, a, but, a, but a clerk that my father was very, very proud of. Um, it's a wonderful book. And um, 
you know, it's a great book for those interested in the development of American law, American constitutions, just a book about law. It's, it's uh, extraordinarily edifying uh, from that perspective. We'll talk more about it. Uh, but also just for those interested in the development and growth of this country, uh, because uh, the, the cases discussed in the book are cases about, you know, about slavery, uh, about uh, polygamy in Utah, um, uh, about equal rights for women, and, um, and uh, about land as we moved west. So it's a story about America, too, and as Jeff's already said, about uh, the uh, sort of ever-increasing rise of democracy, at least uh, in the states. So I commend it to those who are just interested in American history as well. Um, I, uh, I took a course at Chicago Law School with Gerhard Casper, who uh, I, I think was the dean of the law school at the time. He went on to be a president at uh, Stanford uh, University, but he, he taught a course in uh, state constitution making, and it was a wonderful course for a second year uh, law student. Um, we uh, read uh, you know, each of the early state constitutions and their revisions, uh, a lot of which occurred in that 10 year period uh, between the Declaration of Independence and uh, you know, the so called uh, miracle at Philadelphia. And I, I totally agree. Uh, with the author who's seeking to sell this book, I totally agree that um, to understand the federal constitution that was bequeathed to us and really hasn't been changed all that much, uh, you learn uh, a great amount uh, by studying what was going on in that period beforehand uh, where you had John Adams helping write the Massachusetts Constitution, you know, James Madison, Virginia. And these are great Americans who went on to have substantial input in the uh, federal constitution, but there were lessons learned in those years between. Um, the uh, early state constitutions were particularly harsh on executive power because they didn't like King George. Um, but even in that 10 year period, it came to be recognized that no, we do need, as um, Hamilton would later say, energy in the executive. We need to empower the executive more. And the book does a nice job uh, telling the story of how uh, in the decades following, uh, Americans came to appreciate more and more actually the need for more restrictions on the legislature, uh, not merely those that empowered the executive, but uh, changes which empowered the people in different ways. Um, so uh, for those wanting to uh, understand the original meaning of, of our Constitution, what was on the framers' minds at the time, and, and even what particular phrases mean, um, that period's critical, and, and the book does a really nice job covering it. I remember around the time that Judge Sutton was was nominated and appointed to the court, it was when we were seeing sort of a, a flurry of fights over judicial appointments. <clears throat> and I went back and I read the constitutional debates, Madison's notes from the debates in 1787, and the, the the men at the convention had gone around and around on different ways to appoint federal judges, make appointments in general. Should the president do it alone? Should Congress do it? And then one of the delegates from Massachusetts says, "Well, in Massachusetts, we have this advice and consent model." And, the, and in Madison's notes, they basically just adopted on the spot. Uh, and it was, it was funny to me that many, many years later, in the early 2000s, I was in law school reading this, and it dawned on me, nobody ever actually researched what they did in Massachusetts, what the actual practice was like. Everybody just sort of glossed. You see a lot of scholarships saying it was based on the Massachusetts model, but nobody ever actually studied it. So I was struck by that at the time, and, and reading your book, you know, an example after example, it was interesting to think through not just the lessons we learned, but how we could understand the branches today, and maybe focusing on the courts a little bit with judicial um, selection, you explain in the book about how state judges are often directly elected. And you walk through that, but then you, you point out there's real implications for our conception of the judges themselves then and the judicial power in a, a, in a regime where the judges are elected rather than appointed. Can you maybe describe that? Yeah, so, I mean, once again, it's a comparative point, and the comparison is just astonishing. Um, so here we are in 2022. We have the federal court model, which has embraced judicial uh, review, enforcement of judicial constitutional rights, more than any country in world history. So on the one hand, we embrace judicial review the most at the federal level under the federal document. It, the document we federal judges are construing constitutionalizing this right or that one, also happens to be the most difficult in world history to amend. I think Australia has 75%, but that's about it. No one makes it the threshold so that, that high. You talk about incentives. I mean, that is the most beautiful system in the world if you can get a constitutional ruling in your favor, right? It's not correctable. 
because the, the judges, life tenure, you don't know when they're going to retire, um, you don't know who's going to be president, and you know the three-quarters ratification process is very difficult to do. You know, I was, I was wondering where this life tenure idea came from. It actually came from a state experience. Um, Rhode Island, one of the first state courts to do judicial review, the legislature was really upset with the fact that the state court had invalidated this uh, debtor rights protection. They were looking after debtors, early Rhode Island history. And um, the legislature called the five justices into the legislature to explain themselves. Okay, This is early judicial review and how the legislature responded. Four of the five showed up. The fifth said he was busy, uh, very wise. Uh, <laughs> And they ultimately did not overrule their decision, which they were thinking about doing, saying, you have no right to do this. But the terms were only for a year. They were appointed by the legislature. And so what did they do? They didn't appoint the four that showed up. The fifth who didn't gets back on the court. Hamilton sees this, and that's the explanation for life tenure. You, you want to know the amusing part of the story is that the sovereign with the largest territory to oversee the U.S. Supreme Court, the federal courts, has life tenure. And guess what the other sovereign in the country that has life tenure with no restrictions on age? Rhode Island. So the smallest and the biggest have life tenure. The, state, the rest of states have said, you've got to be kidding me. So they have age limitations. And 90% of state court judges are elected. So that's consistent with the democracy point of electing more often. And then the other feature, which makes the states just this remarkable contrast to the federal system on judges, is you know, you, you, when you're examining structure, you want to ask yourself risks. Like, what do you do when it goes badly? What do you do when the president is corrupt? What do you do when the court does something it shouldn't? How do you change it? Well, at the state level, it's really easy. It's a 51% vote in almost every state. Florida's 60%. Colorado's maybe 55 Everybody else, 51%. So what a contrast that is. So I feel like the, what has happened in American federal judicial review is for the interest groups, the incentives are all one-stop shopping, go to DC, constitutionalize your victory. It is a gerrymandering victory of the most supreme sort. And it, you know, if it works, it's great. But what has happened is we've gotten federalism completely backwards when it comes to judicial interpretation. If the state court judges are the ones that are elected, if the constitutions they're interpreting can be amended quickly, we should have them be the ones that are the experimenter in chiefs, the first responders to new issues about structure or rights, have ground up development of constitutional rights, really just like Brandeis, ground up development of legislative ideas, only nationalize when a winning insight emerges. But at the U.S. Supreme Court level, we've forgotten federalism. And really, ever since the Warren Court, it's been top down. And you know, basically, if you get your federal constitutional ruling, it doesn't get any better than that. And if you lose, you go back to the second shot at the states. And somehow, we've got to fix that. Uh, because I can just, it's not sustainable. The current path is not sustainable without politicizing the court. Because what will ultimately happen with the Biden commission, with one of its members, Adam here, Adam White here, does anything or not, the reality is the American people are ultimately going to treat these nine as representatives, not as judges. And the game is over when that's how we see our judges. We might as well have 100, two from each state, and call it a third chamber of the legislature. You know, on the um, removability of uh, judges and justices, uh, your, your book points out that the concept was to protect these people from uh, the legislature, protect them uh, uh, from the executive, perhaps, who's angered by a decision. But it was never to protect them from the people, right? right. And so that's how you, it became quite acceptable to uh, have elections for judges, which for those of us who focus on the federal system still think is a bit odd and, um, you know, and, and, and too, too political in a sense. But, uh, Jeff, one thing your uh, book talks about is uh, whether uh, state judges or federal judges hew more closely to the actual uh, text uh, you know, of the statute or of the Constitution. And by the way, I have to part company with the, 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 the suggestion that um, you know, I see states as laboratories of democracy, but not laboratories of judicial activism. 
Um, but, uh, but fighting uh, words. <laughs> here we go. Uh, but uh, forty but I, minutes but I, in, I, I see the point that it, it can be helpful to uh, for the, uh, the federal courts at least not to do something until uh, they've had an opportunity to observe what's what's happened in the states. Um, but I think you have data suggesting that uh, state courts actually hew to the law more regularly than federal courts do. And you know, one reason might be. Um, Supreme Court justices in the United States decide this document is just too antiquated. I am called upon to act. Um, but another explanation uh, would be the election threat. And I think you make the point makes sense. Uh, you know, I'm up for re-election as a judge, and uh, I've got to explain something I did. You know, if it's right there in the statute uh, or in the Constitution, you know, there's an explanation to be given by the justice or by the justice's supporters. But um, the more it just looks like a frolic and detour from the laws enacted by the people, then the more vulnerable that person might be on re-election. So you could see how uh, judicial elections could actually force judges to be more judge-like, although I've always thought it made them more political. You know, maybe not. Well, it's, I mean, this is a really big topic, and it's, it's I, I need to be careful about having too many convictions on this because I think a lot of it is speculative. But... But I, I want to start by responding to Gene's point because um, when I say uh, the state courts, state high courts, is laboratories of experimentation either with structure or rights, same structure and rights in the federal model, I don't mean um, a laboratory of experimentation that starts only with the federal baseline. Um, so if we we'll add another merit, uh, metaphor, not just laboratories of experimentation, let's go to free markets. I want a true free market of exper where you're experimenting truly, and it's not a free market if you start with the federal baseline and only experiment with more libertarianism, more more constitutional rights. This is this is just this has blown me away the last five or six years when I've gone around the country talking to state court judges. Lawyers and judges have not appreciated the point that a state court judge is allowed to say, for example. We don't have substantive due process. Our due process clause is a procedural clause. It doesn't have a substantive component. There's no obligation to start the bidding at the federal baseline. Proof of that is some state constitutions don't even have an equal protection clause. If you don't have a clause, it proves you could interpret it below the federal baseline. The only thing a state court judge has to do is when they have a federal claim in front of them, then they have to honor the federal precedent. But if they have two claims in front of them, they're, they're free to say, for example, we don't have an exclusionary rule under the for our search and seizure guarantee. We don't have a right to privacy or a right to abortion under our due process clause. They're free to say that. So I, I think Gene's right. It wouldn't be a free market of experimentation if you only experimented upwards. And I think historically, in the last 50 years, when people have thought of state constitutions, sad to say, they have only thought of it as an experimentation going up. And I've, I've really been trying to emphasize, because if they're going to be sources of information for the federal courts, it's only valuable if they're doing an honest inquiry as to what the original public meaning is in both directions. So I think that's really significant. So it's hard for me to say which, federal, which system, the federal courts or the state courts, have done a better job honoring the language of their constitutions. But I have a pretty strong suspicion that if you, if you thought of it this way, you put on the left side of the page the state constitutions, or did just one state, it's state constitution, and the right side of the page, how the courts have interpreted that language, there'd be quite a bit more correlation between interpretation and language at the state level than you would get at the federal level, where we have so many doctrines, so many areas of federal constitutional law that are not remotely connected to the text of the federal constitution. So that has me thinking, you know, when I, early in my career as a lawyer, I was very skeptical of the idea of electing judges because I found myself saying, why would you use a majoritarian process to select people for a non-majoritarian job, right? I mean, we judges are not supposed to put our fingers in the wind. Then I went through the federal confirmation process as a court of appeals judge, which took two years, 52-41, um, not a big mandate, I would say. That was my vote. And 
It's like going for a D minus. You miss one more multiple choice. <laughs> no credit for you. Uh, so I, I really, I felt like a bill going through Congress. And the idea that the federal confirmation process is apolitical seems, you know, fanciful to me at, the, at this point. You know, some of my state court judge friends have said this about the election process, which I think is a really wonderful point, and I'm afraid indicts, well, I'll just say me, at least one federal judge. Um, she was making the point that when you have to campaign, whatever it is, every four years, six years, eight years, it's humbling. You kind of have to ask yourself, why should they be trusting me? So you're back with the people. You're explaining what your philosophy of judging is. But fundamentally, you know, we think of, we get cynical about elections. But there are, there's a way in which it's very humbling. It forces the the person, the official, to you know, be able to explain why it's they, called accountability. Accountability. <laughs> why do I deserve what a concept? The, why do I deserve this power? Why do I deserve this power? And how do I exercise it? And so, the the reality is there is no minoritarian way to select any judges. It's not possible. And you know, I don't know what the answer is to whether we should have you know, eighteen year terms at the federal level. But I got to say, I'm very open minded to it, particularly if it comes with a pension. I've already got my 18 years in. I've got a lot of self-interest in this. But I do have to wonder if we've raised the stakes of the federal selection process to make state court elections look silly by comparison. You know, we're just channeling so much political energy into these, you know, every once in a while, you know, U.S. Supreme Court selections. And, you know, that's why they, the votes tend to be so partisan, which is really depressing from a judge's perspective, particularly, you know, I don't think of myself as someone should wear a blue or a red robe. And yet if almost all the votes, including for, even for district court judges, sometimes are purely partisan, it's really worrisome. It starts to look like representatives and not judges. And um, so judicial selection at the state level with, ele you know, that with elections, that has problems. But, you know, a lot of them have retention elections or long terms. I happen to favor the you know, elections, but long terms, you know, 10, 12 years, that seems to kind of, you know, be between too hot and too cold. Um, but fundamentally, I guess the last point I would make on this score is it's the judge's problem. The more we judges do, the more, I think, frankly, outrageous it is for us to complain when the people want to say and who we are. <laughs> I mean, that's your accountability point. The more power federal or state judges are going to exercise, I think the odder it is for them to complain about any selection system. They should be saying the opposite. If you're exercising a lot of power, you should be very open-minded to the idea that the people might want someone else. And, and anyway, but that, the, the fact that the states are so nimble in terms of responding to democracy and this movement, that movement, shifting norms, means I think the state court judges, if we're going to have experiments, and maybe, Gene, your point is we shouldn't have experiments at all, but if we're going to have experiments, they should be at the state level, where they can be corrected most easily. And you know, I think this group of people would appreciate the longer you're in law or in judging, the more you start to focus less on what the right answer is and on the risks of the wrong answer. And I feel like that's where judges should spend a lot more of their attention. And there's a lot of risk with judicializing too many policies at the federal level. And I think we're seeing them currently. Jeff, I wanted to um, comment on a part of the book that uh, you and Adam already talked about, and then maybe change the topic. I've already talked about how uh, sort of understanding our constitution's past uh, the book is helpful in um, talking about the state constitutions that uh, preceded the federal constitution. But I think uh, as we think about where we go forward in certain areas, the book is informative too. And Jeff's already talked about it. But I found the discussion of administrative law actually extremely illuminating, um, you know, basically for the reasons you gave. But um, the degree to which uh, courts should give deference to interpretations of regulations by agencies. So-called Chevron deference is a really, really big issue. Uh, 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 in, in the courts right now, when the Supreme Court, it seems, will uh, tackle possibly as early as this term, a lot of passion around it. By the way, I just love the fact that 62% of Floridians 
wanted a, an anti-Chevron constitutional amendment. You think, how could you get that passionate about Chevron? But then uh, what do the referendum say? And I can imagine it, you know, it might have said something like this. Should the judges whom you elect uh, defer as to the meaning of the law to unelected bureaucrats? You know, that gets at least 62%. I mean, you, you, you sort of put the Chevron proposition to the ordinary American. They're like, wait a minute, why would a judge do that? Um, and by the way, I should hasten to add, I'm not as vociferous uh, Chevron opponent as some. I think there are arguments to be made for it. But one of those arguments is take away Chevron, how's it going to work? And as Jeff says, it gets a lot harder to advance that particular argument without at least addressing the fact that the majority of a vast majority of jurisdictions in the country don't have Chevron deference and, 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 and seem to be doing OK. I think you'd actually want to look at whether they're dealing with regulatory structures as dense and as complicated with as much regulatory litigation as the federal government deals with. But still, it's, it's obviously relevant that um, Chevron largely doesn't exist in the states. And then by contrast, the non-delegation doctrine, this question of uh, what limits are we going to place on Congress's ability to write laws that essentially say to agencies, here, uh, you, you make all the important decisions. Uh, you know, we, we need to get out and raise funds. Should, to what extent should we say that uh, legislation needs to be more specific, make the tough choices with agencies doing the implementation? Uh, my father was um, skeptical of an aggressive application of the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, because uh, he didn't see a viable uh, doctrine uh, and, and a workable approach. But again, the states, at least on the books, have non-delegation doctrines. Uh, and it's therefore, I think, at least looking into how they're being applied, whether things are functioning well, I think that can be informative of what we do. Um, and, and so on another subject entirely, which I think it's worth touching on. Actually, Gene, there's a yeah. question from the audience on the delegation and deference. Yeah. Can we throw that in and yeah. then you follow up? So this, the reason I interrupted this comes not just from an audience member, but one of your former clerks Excellent. has written this <laughs> in, although she or he didn't identify themselves. Um, two questions. The first is when the states that prohibit deference and delegation, did this follow after an era where delegation and deference had been allowed? and that this came afterwards? So they just wanted to clarify what the sort of the sequence was. And then the second question is, is might there, based on your study of this, might there be problems that arise uh, if the federal courts were to revise their delegation and deference doctrines, problems that, that might concern you? Yeah, so the, the, the Keith Whittington uh, research is so terrific. And his point, it's called, you know, non-delegation alive and well, the non-delegation doctrine. And he's saying from the founding to the present, the states have been vigorously doing non-delegation. So at least when it comes to the non-delegation point, I think that's been pretty live. My understanding of the Chevron story is for reasons of their own, the state courts just never embrace that. And I think part of it, it makes me smile to think, I'm, I'm imagining a conference 40 years ago here, uh, your dad's trying to drum up people wanting to come talk administrative law. And he would have had to work about as hard as I have to work to get people to want to talk about state constitutions. You're like, what? Administrative <laughs> law? Why does this really matter? And now it's so significant. My hope, by the way, in 40 years, state constitutions will be the same. But the, you know, I, don't, I do not see, um, I, I, like Gene, I am not someone who thinks, oh, let's just get rid of Chevron. It's got an inherent you know, separation of powers problem. I would like to know exactly what the new model is going to look like. Because um, one thing about Chevron, it was actually a humility doctrine from the federal courts. So it, it took away federal court power. That's not something we've seen a lot of the last 60 years. And so instinctively, I didn't think that was a terrible idea. I suspect what has happened in the states is what will happen at the federal level without a formal deference doctrine. And that's that informally, federal courts will probably be somewhat trusting of agency lawyers when it comes to highly reticulated statutory schemes. I, I suspect that's what will happen. It won't be you win because you said so. It'll be you win because we're persuaded with the reasonableness of that interpretation. And you know how much that's really moving the needle? I don't know. Um, but I, I wanted to respond to one other thing about administrative law before we shift, because it really is a great illustration of how foolish it is to think only of the federal side of things and forget the state side of things. 
Incentives are so significant. What do you think the incentives are for interest groups if at the federal level we don't police delegations, whether they're explicit or implicit, and we've got a vigorous Chevron? If at the same time, at the state level, they don't have deference to agencies and they police delegations, what are you doing when you get one federal agency to do your bidding? You're a, a end running all the hassles <laughs> of complying with those procedural requirements at the state level, whether they're under the state APA, every state has an APA, whether it's no deference to the agency, or whether it's policing overly broad delegations. So if you ask yourself incentives why the interest groups have just loved the current state of federal administrative law, it's not just that one agency can preempt all of these states, it's also, as a matter of policy, it's also that they can end run all the procedural requirements arising out of separation of powers, APAs at the state level. So that, that should make you very skeptical from my perspective of the current federal doctrine. We have the most deference, the fewest checks for the agencies with the most power in the country. Reminds you a little of federal judicial review, doesn't it? I mean, it's a beautiful game if you can win it. You know, Gene, by the way, when your father was here at AEI, he was so interested in these issues, he actually helped to start Regulation Magazine. You have sure. to really love the administrative law field. What was the subscription whole... number? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I used to, I'd pick it up on the newsstand next to Hollywood Reporter. Is where I'd get I, I actually had a discussion uh, with my father about this when yeah. I uh, became an editor of my high school newspaper, and he made some deprecating comment about my circulation. And I, I did ask him <laughs> what his was. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> he did not uh, uh, consider that to be a, 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 a question to be answered. <laughs> we, said, we, we, few, we few, we lucky few. Um, but Gene, I cut you off earlier. You're going to raise another yeah, issue. So uh, you know, non-delegation doctrines are one way that the people of a state can limit, um, pr place restrictions on what the legislature can do. Um, but Jeff, your book talks about others, and uh, I, I was quite interested in that part. You know, we lawyers uh, talk a lot about power of courts, limit on courts, and maybe a little less on potential constitutional or legislative limits on congressional behavior. And, um, uh, but when we look at all of the problems with our federal government today, um, certainly some might be addressed by constitutional amendments that go to how Congress functions. And, and, you know, and what better candidates that, than um, uh, amendments that have already been made in the states. The state governments continue to function. Uh, and, 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 and so I think that you have a number of examples in the book, but uh, I thought people might be interested here. A couple, uh, the, the single subject rule, and then what is it, the, the clear title uh, rule, which both, <laughs> I, I gather, originated in a uh, massive land fraud in the state of Georgia early on. Yeah, no, the, I mean, this is one where the federal model would have to be amended, um, but there's a lot to learn from the states. And these are all state provisions that did not exist at the founding. So these aren't provisions that were in the early state constitutions and the federal framers rejected. They came later. <clears throat> so balanced budget amendments. So you know, you want to talk about a highly consequential difference between the state governments and the feds, is the states every year, every two years, have got to balance their, their budget. I mean, that's really consequential. What's one way they do it? Line item vetoes. Um, and they use line item vetoes primarily for appropriation. Um, it, I think it turns on how libertarian you are because uh, the more libertarian you are, the more you would just love single subject requirements because the way they work at the state level is they say, you know, you can have an education bill, but that's it. It's got to be education related. You can't combine all these other subjects, um, which are the result of log rolling or riders during the legislative process. And so, on their face, I would say, Gene, they look pretty good. Now, the, I have to acknowledge the downside of the single subject rules, which is the state courts have not been paragons of neutral interpretation of those provisions. Um, it's really hard to sort out when they enforce them, when they don't. Um, you know, I have a scar on my back from, you know, I argued the Ohio voucher project, a voucher a case back in the 90s, and we won on the Establishment Clause, federal and state, we won on the Uniformity Clause, we won on everything, but we lost on the Single Subject Clause. So they invalidated on that ground, although 
it wasn't a very expensive loss because one nice thing about single subject and other procedural rules is the legislature can fix those. And that indeed is what happened in Ohio. 30 days later, they passed a standalone education bill, new pilot voucher project for your hometown of Cleveland, and, um, and off we went. And that's what ultimately led to the, the Zellman decision. Um, the clear title provisions, those are really funny. I mean, I mean they, they, some of you know the Yazoo land fraud, uh, just outrageous, the late 1700s in Georgia, where basically the legislature was just giving away Western land, um, sometimes Native American land, and just giving it to their friends. And the people found out and went ballistic. And um, you know, a lot of political careers were lost. And uh, that's where the clear title provision comes from. You got to put in the title of the bill what you're doing. So if you're going to commit fraud, you say fraudulent <laughs> allocations of land to friends. Uh, yeah. You know, would be an honest title and. Shockingly, not many people have those kinds of bills anymore, uh, so they've worked pretty well. So the, 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 the upshot is um, this all grows out of, the, both of you have made this point that at the founding, no one thought courts were our answer. People thought the executive branch was the enemy, King George and all that. And the idea was what could go wrong by putting all power in the legislature, particularly when most people were elected for a year at a time. There weren't professional politicians. It was a small government. And so the idea was, what could possibly go wrong with almost all power in the legislature? And by the end of the 1700s, they looked at, they found what could go wrong. The, the legislators could be as corruptible as a king or a governor or a president. And that's what leads to all these procedural requirements on state legislation. But at a time where it's, it's really too late to get it in the federal constitution at the outset. And you know it is surprising. All the states have these things. So you would think you could get a, 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 a US constitutional amendment through. Um, you know, one, I'll, I'll say just one other point on that subject, but it's, it's just a, an astonishing fact. States like Mississippi, California, Ohio, and Colorado, their constitutions have more in common with each other than any of them have with the US Constitution. If Mississippi and California want the same thing, how is that not in the federal constitution? It's really astonishing. And there are two things. Either people decided not to amend the federal constitution to put it in there, or it now is in the federal constitution, but amendment by interpretation, which has become our, our go-to approach to changing the meaning of the federal constitution um, if you can get five votes at the court, you amend by interpretation as opposed to amending it formally. Uh, I have more questions, and I'm sure Gene does too, but maybe this would be a good time to open the floor to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, raise your hand and just wait for the microphone to find you. Uh, the first question will be right here in back, and then you, sir, will be the next question. Thanks. So we heard a lot about uh, taking state public law from the state constitutions. Have you thought at all about taking state private law? Because I, as, as I understand, all private law is state law in the United States, a tort contract and importing that. And the clause that I'm reminded of when I think about this is um, the president is able to hire people through the federal constitution, but this constitution never explicitly said whether he can fire them. And so when they had that debate, I think that what settled it was that they looked at um, the, uh, the norm at the time in, in private law was that at will employment. And so, well, if you can hire, you can fire. Uh, yeah. and because state constitutions are built on top of state private law, or private law that came before, because it's positive law, right? Uh, and then the federal is on top of that. So how do you, how do you interpret this? Yeah, so, so initially, the, uh, the private law, let's think common law of torts, property, contracts, um, you know, that common law, that's what led to Brandeis's insight of laboratories of experimentation. That, that's just what he's talking about, is letting the states be these common law laboratories. The, the metaphor gets extended to state legislatures because over time we've become a country at the state and federal level, which is much more used to positive law as opposed to common law, and that's true even in contracts, property, and torts increasingly. So. I, am, I embrace that model entirely. Sadly, there's not a lot of federal common law unless it's federal constitutional law, which as Justice Scalia pointed out, looks a lot like the common law method. 
Um, so the at-will employment firing point is super interesting. You know, at the federal level, as a matter of separation of powers, you know, we've got this Humphreys executor case and a little bit of cutting back on that in recent years and kind of the question of how is this going to work. And the critique of Humphreys is how is that consistent with the unitary executive? How, frankly, are independent agencies ex consistent with the independent executive? There, I, 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 I hate to acknowledge when state experiences aren't that useful for the federal model, but I'm afraid this is one of them because the separate election of the state officials becomes your go-to. The at-will doctrine it becomes at the next election doctrine is, is really what happens. And I think because at the state level, at a minimum, most states have five to six independently elected branches, you don't have this same intense debate about whether the leader of an executive branch has authority to fire. That, in, you know, I'm sure it has come up. I don't want to say it hasn't come up, but it just doesn't come up the same way. And the, you know, the pressures are so much different at the federal level with the federal government getting, executive branch getting so big over time, so many agencies, and then some of them being, quote, independent. And so, um, but I, you know, I certainly like the idea that at will was the backdrop. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Gene, do you have anything to throw in there? Well, so the next question is over here, sir. The microphone is coming over. You know, about a week and a half ago at our conference for Justice Alito's jurisprudence, Jack Goldsmith gave a paper on sort of thinking about the, the Erie, uh, Erie Railroad doctrine uh -huh. and maybe that would go away. It'd be time to resume federal common law. So maybe we, we will need to resort to state common law again. Well, well, just remember, the court does Erie, giving yeah. states all this power at the time they're deciding to give Congress all this power. I think yeah. it was a compromise. Yeah. And maybe, maybe there's a time for new compromises. Who knows? Interesting. Sir, go ahead. We doubled the size of the country in the 50 years before the Civil War. So I'm wondering to what extent the constitutions of the states that became part of the Union in the first half of the 19th century can be examined to understand the correct interpretation of the Civil War amendments. Right. Oh, that's a wonderful point. I, I thought you were going to go a slightly different direction with that. So I'll, just, I'll, I'll answer the question you didn't ask and then the one you did ask. The one you didn't ask is how, how is it relevant to use later state constitutions, which could not have been the model for the 1789 constitution? And I would agree from the perspective of original public meaning, they're not that relevant. Um, from the perspective of pragmatism and living constitutionalism, they remain super relevant. And I quite agree with the premise of your question that those state constitutions before the Civil War, before 1868, when the 14th Amendment's ratified, are very useful for, for figuring out the meaning of the 14th Amendment. And doubly, doubly useful if we go beyond just the meaning of procedural due process um, and equal protection in the 14th Amendment um, and go to incorporation. Because of co incorporation, of course, comes through the 14th Amendment. I mean, it's, it's one of our first forms of substantive due process is incorporation. So that makes not just the state constitutions that come into being because we have these new states before the Civil War, but it means state court decisions long after 1789 or long after 1791 can become relevant. And, um, you know, so if you think of McDonald, which applies the Second Amendment to the states, and you're, you're trying to confirm it's an individual right, you know, which is, of course, the combination of Heller and McDonald, um, there's a lot of state court decisions that confirm at the state level the right to bear arms language was definitely an individual right. Um, now, a lot of those state clauses didn't have the prefatory clause, which is a slight complication, but the reality is that if you're focused on what people would have thought the core language of the Second Amendment would have meant, uh, there's an awful lot of evidence showing that at the state level they thought it was an individual right as opposed to a militia right. There are very few militia-only clauses at the state level, and that's very strange because the militia is a state militia. So if it was militia-only, you would think it would be reflected in state constitutional clauses about militias. It's not. I would, you know, I would just add that um, I'm not familiar with what interpretive significance a lot of those amendments uh, prior 
to the Civil War amendments might have. But just as an historical matter, uh, you know, the book is a good reminder that so many uh, uh, crossroads that we know so well on the federal level, um, you know, when we finally uh, prohibited slavery, um, uh, when, when women um, finally were guaranteed you know, the right to vote, that those were battles that had been fought uh, for decades prior, maybe even longer prior in, in some states. And so uh, just as uh, what was adopted uh, uh, for the federal government in 1789 reflected in part battles fought in the states prior to that, so also so much of the civil rights history that we know well, of course, uh, things were getting sorted out in the states for uh, decades prior, which you know, ultimately informed what happened at the federal level. We, we've kind of lost our tradition of using the Article V federal amendment process to deal with changes in norms or a view that there's something wrong with the federal constitution. That was the way we did it. The 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote, started in the western states, the western state constitutions, uh, and when you go ratification state by state, you know, you're going to start obviously with the states that are most amenable to it and already reflect it in their positive law. And I can understand the incentives for not going through the ratification process. It takes a long time. Giving women the right to vote took about 75 years. Um, but the part of this that does puzzle me a little bit, and I'm no expert on political parties, but a lot of those movements advantaged political parties. In other words, political parties figured out how a federal constitutional amendment was actually very helpful to them to bringing a constituency, a base, in, and then winning state by state. It might be trench warfare state by state. It might take a long time, but it paid political dividends in the interim. And I think that's partly why that happened. And I think people have decided that either was a false lesson or who cares? It's just so much quicker to get five votes. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm disappointed. I mean, I think there's there's only eight. It depends how you count, but there's only eight U.S. Supreme Court decisions that have been overruled by constitutional amendment. I mean, does anyone really think a, a group of human beings would only make eight mistakes in almost 245 years? Of course not. So, you know. It'd be nice to think about that as another way to uh, deal with that inherent problem of human beings judging. We only have a little time left. There's, there's still time, though, for some more questions. In, in the meantime, I'm just curious, Gene, you've had the perspective of having led a federal agency, including one that can have real ramifications for, for, for state law and, and through its preemptive effect. And, and you and your private practice, you work with, with clients whose issues are often sort of nationwide at the federal level. I'm just curious, as you read the book, did, did it occur to you any sort of areas of law or policy or governance where, where you'd prefer not to see sort of experiment at the state level, where you'd sort of prefer to see things focused at the federal level for any, any number of reasons? And your, your father, in one of his famous articles, actually would have been 40 years ago this year, right, the two faces of federalism at the, 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 the first Federal Society student convention, he was making an argument for federal power as much as anything, right? Saying that conservatives of that era had spent so much time arguing in favor of the states, they might have forgotten the importance of, of, of the federal government uh, and, that, and that federalism works in both directions. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm just curious if you have any, any thoughts on the limits of state experimentation. My, my principal thought was, thank God, I, I did not have to uh, run uh, for office to hold uh, the position of Secretary of Labor. That actually would have been... <laughs> It, at least in Alaska, or on a, a lot more painful than uh, the nomination and confirmation process that we have. Um, but uh, you know, it, it did strike me that it would have been much more difficult to um, uh, deal with some of the things the federal government needs to deal with if uh, you did not have the unitary executive um, in, in, in our federal government and set aside you know, war powers and the like, which Sadly, the labor secretary has only a small part in. But um, it, it, you know, uh, I think of dealing with the, the COVID crisis, and if what we had had was you know separately elected HHS heads, uh, labor department heads, other agencies, and a president, it, it could have made it um, much more difficult to move in the you know coordinated way we, we did through, through much of it. 
Um, how would your client? How do your clients react to federalism? Though, aren't your clients into the one-stop shopping? Oh well, that's that's a separate issue. Yeah, no, I, I learned as a uh, a very young associate that uh, this you know sort of great value of young conservatives federalism was the bane of the existence of every major U.S. corporation. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, you know, they are a, you know an important force for uh, uh, you know uniform legislation. Sometimes with the merits of the legislation being secondary, just, just tell me the rule and I'll and I'll follow it. Uh, but let me follow it everywhere. Well, I mean, and you, you've you've experienced that. I, I, I have experienced. I mean, the one thing that frustrates me a little bit on this topic, because I appreciate the point, the court just took a case, which really illustrates the problem corporations face. I think it's how California was regulating pork production. California doesn't have a lot of pork production there, but they were saying if you're going to sell in our state, you have to have certain humane um, protections when it comes to protecting the pigs all before you kill them. See Charlotte's Web. And um, the, the thrust of the argument is it just doesn't seem right. It's, it seems like an extraterritorial regulation for California, a very prominent state, to set a rule which basically all the pork producers are going to have to follow, including in Arkansas. And so classic in America, the last 60 years, it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court for the Dormant Commerce Clause. Like, we, we can fix this problem and, you know, get rid of too much federalism by having an extraterritorial prohibition, which, you know, is invented. And your father has a very good dissent making the point. It's completely invented. I don't know if he believed in it by the end, but he was very strong on this at the outset. Everybody forgets that if a state is behaving that way, Congress can fix it. Congress can say, no, California, you can't do that. Clearly, it's commerce. Even a federalist guy like me would admit that's interstate commerce. And again, we, we, we refuse to go to our elected representatives to fix these problems because it's so beautiful to have life-tenured federal judges fixing them for us. And, you know, I don't know. Um, but I, 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 I understand... The, their problem. I guess if I ran a corporation, I'd want one rule too. Um, but I'd like it to be a good rule. And the downside of just jumping too quickly to one rule is you might get a bad rule. As, as, oh, go ahead, Gene. Well, I mean, sure, you know, it, it, experimentation um, uh, is, is preferable and, uh, and, and, and preferably not at the national level. Uh, you know, on the other hand, some of the uniform national rules that we end up with um, are palatable to our largest national corporations, right, and impose costs on smaller companies that they're much less able to withstand. That's a separate problem yeah. with some of the uniform rules we end up with. That's true. As a native-born Iowan, obviously I care a lot about this, uh, this California case. But, I mean, it reminds me of a sort of a broader issue that occurred to me reading the book, that it's one thing if you have sort of 50 experiments or 51 experiments, if you include the District of Columbia, you know, sort of leading up to federal policy, but it seems to me in this day and age you're just as likely to have sort of two experiments running in many different states at the same time, right? Blue state experiments, red state experiments, and you could also see the national sort of political organizations trying to do what they're doing in California, right, which is use one state as leverage to create national policy out of, or create national policy out of one state. And so I guess the question then is how do you preserve the the, the system as, as many laboratories of experiment within the states without just using those experiments as leverage to change federal policy without changing federal policy. Yeah, I mean, you're too kind to put it this way, but some people put it the way of what go to these states anyway. I mean, it's just another source of regulation. What is the function of them? I get the history, but, you know, America with the Internet, travel, communication, there's a lot of commonality in the country. And you know, my first glib answer is to say, I'll take you to an Ohio State-Michigan game, and you tell me whether you think these two states are different. <laughs> my second, more serious answer is I just got back from uh, Tucson, Arizona, and that, that is a different place from Ohio. And place affects culture. Place affects tradition. Um, you know, and, and I, I do think there are, those are important things to preserve. But, Adam, I do worry about this point that there's a risk of ambition at the local level politically that everybody's focused on, you know, just thinking of state jobs as junior varsity efforts to get onto the varsity, i.e. a federal job. And that really would destroy federalism. 
Um, you can't have the 50 state AGs just doing blue and red causes, which has changed since I was a state SG in the 90s when uh, there was a lot more independence of each state. And now, particularly on the very um, high salience um, political you know, cases, um, you do get it lining up with politicians of one stripe on one side and politicians on the other. And two experiments is not the same as 50. But I, I will say that um, there's still plenty of localism going on. In fact, a lot of it's now at the city level, yeah. which is federalism within federalism. But I think yeah. we might have a question yes, over please. here. Yes, um, my question is regarding um, if there's anything inherent about a federal system um, promoting the Supreme Court to have an activist uh, perspective or uh, interpreting the uh, Constitution more activist. Because uh, in a European perspective, we also have uh, the beginning of a federal system in some sense in the European Union. And uh, our Supreme Court of the European Union is also a bit more activist than the member state Supreme Courts uh, are. They're generally more about the original public meaning whereas the European Supreme Court is more about making the union work uh, as a system. So do you think there's anything inherent about being a Supreme Court of several different constituencies, so to speak, that makes you want to be activist? To me, it seems like it should be the opposite. Like if you think of federalism in the, in the abstract, you would think the experimenters in chief would be subsidiarity, the smaller bodies of government, the experimentation there, Winning insights emerge, then you nationalize and think of the national government with the courts as kind of the backstop. You know, there's some unbargainable rights that can't be breached. I think that was the way it was supposed to start. I think it's really the way it functioned for 150 years. Um, and I, I think the reality of the federal constitution being so difficult to amend and the life tenure of the federal judges is what has incentivized the activism. Now, you could argue there's one other feature of it which is unique to America, and that's our you know, common original sin of slavery and ultimately Jim Crow. And you know, the court in the 60s, and God only knows what I would have thought about that if I were living through the 50s and 60s, and I think it's dangerous to judge it from our perspective, but they really were on a mission to end Jim Crow. I mean, it was animating just about everything they did. And that really did affect things, and you know, and it, it, it did put them much more in the at the top of the scale when it came to initiating policy. And for me, the question is not whether to second guess that. The question is fine. Maybe that was a necessary evil to deal with a really serious problem in American history, but that does not tell you how to operate going forward. It doesn't remotely tell you to operate going forward. Indeed. If you're worried that this crown jewel of American government, the US Supreme Court, which gave us Brown in a 9-0 decision, is getting tarnished, maybe it's because we're asking too much of them. In other words, it's our fault, not their fault. We're the ones that seem to love judicial review, and they're inventing all these rights. Um, and you know, the other thing about the state experience that I didn't have a chance to mention, it can not only be helpful as I was responding to Adam in identifying new substantive due process rights, if, if you believe in substantive due process, the states can become an incredibly useful deal, useful way of dealing what I think is the biggest problem at the court right now. It's not the debate over new rights. It's the debate over what old rights to preserve and which to overrule. And famously, the court has really struggled with a coherent theory of stare decisis. We have one theory that's very clear and very principled, Justice Thomas. He says, if it's clearly wrong as original public meaning, I don't care the consequences, bye-bye. Now, he's been saying that for a long time, and he's yet to get a second vote. And one thing I propose in the book is to say, we ought to ask ourselves a second question. It's not just whether that old decision added a right that isn't in the Constitution, subtracted a right that is there, we should also ask ourselves, today in 2022, is it a harmless error? How would you know whether it's a harmless error outside of the subjective views of the justice? Well, one way of measuring the harmlessness is what the states have been doing ever since. Has that constitutional, federal constitutional decision settled 
have the states either through legislation, state court decisions, or even decisions before that federal decisions shown that they have accepted it. And what would be your measure of harmless air? Well, go back to Article 5, three quarters of the states. If roughly three quarters of the states, I realize this isn't math, it's still judgment, but if roughly three quarters of the states or even more are accepting of whatever that mistaken decision was, why do we need to overrule it? Why do we need to force the states to go through the three quarters ratification process? I realize it's the right thing to do. I realize a formalist would insist it's the right thing to do. But I find myself saying there's, there's a lot of addition and subtraction cases out there and perhaps it's worth focusing on the ones where the air truly still is harmless because we still have a lot of Americans that are very upset about not being able to vote on that issue. And that might be the way to think about it. Just a quick comment on the question. It was an interesting question. And um, I don't know if there's been comparative work done. Maybe you should do it. Um, you know, I could see a theory that the uh, more removed a government official is uh, from the people, uh, the more willful uh, that uh, government official may become, whether that's an executive or a judge. Uh, or, or, so, a, you know, or a king. Uh, <laughs> right. And in a way, it's back to, uh, Jeff, to your point about your colleague who used to go out and have to, you know, campaign. And, you know, that connection with, uh, with the people uh, is something that uh, state officials have much more. I... I, I, I experienced it a bit as labor secretary, going out, traveling, meeting with people. But I think for a lot of people in Washington, D.C., it's not an ordinary experience. And perhaps part of what you're observing there is, is similar, that you've got um, uh, EU officials who, in a sense, forgot where they've come from. Well, as I said at the outset, it wouldn't be possible to even begin to do justice to all the book in just 90 minutes. Uh, so please be sure to go out and, and buy the book and even also read it as well. Uh, but in the meantime, please join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>